Chapter 19 Enton Kember studied the situation through a telescope and found it grim. The Garnian Battalion's forlorn hope was being pinned in the breach, raked by grapeshot and musket volleys, and cut to bloody ribbons. The supporting companies, the companies that were supposed to exploit the hope's sacrifice, were formed up in the rear and showed no sign of advancing. The column of smoke rising over the city said that the captain's mob of townsfolk must have had some success, but the penned-up mass of civilians said that their career as a fighting force had been short-lived. She hoped the captain herself wasn't stuck in that pen, or worse. Sir, there, the deck lookout said, pointing two points to port. There's a couple score of Vins chasing after a small group. He leaned forward over the rail, as if being a foot closer would make all the difference in resolving pertinent details. They've got the Vins hopping mad. Kember nodded. That must be the captain. Has the word to rig a signal lamp. She went to the taffrail to look aft. The Ayaz der Hau was still about a mile behind, but now several thousand feet above them and still climbing. She would follow Mistral and set up shop, no doubt, so that if Mistral came in to give close support to the assaulting 132nd, the Ayaz der Hau could fire shells at her from the safety of altitude. And so Mistral would have no choice but to stand safely away and watch the men of the 132nd die in the breach, or spend precious time matching Ayaz der Hau's altitude while the men of the 132nd died in the breach. She could see no other options. But the captain would know what to do. The captain always had an idea. The signalman, Private Turk, called from the forward rail. Signal lamp rigged, sir! She stepped back to the commander's station, ahead of and between the steersmen. Signal, enemy of greater force in pursuit, request orders. Then repeat it. Captain signaling, the lookout said. Wig wag, message reads, maintain course and speed, rig ladder for one pickup. Bernie and Jutes will remain to aid resistance. He looked back, lowering his telescope. Ladder for pickup? That can't be right. Want me to ask her to repeat it, sir? Kember took a good look at the man while most of the deck crew snickered. He was one of the replacement crew and hadn't been with them during their actions the previous year. No need, she said. Secure signal lamp, pass the word to rig ladder. It wouldn't take long to close on the captain's position, but even that short time seemed to go by at an accelerated rate, for Ensign Kember had still come up with no possible explanation or excuse for Lieutenant Hannon's death. None that could reasonably be believed at any rate. Whenever Kember tried to imagine a way out, it always ended with her running to the rail and jumping overboard. It wasn't just that. It was that she'd never killed anyone before. Well, she'd killed people with a cannon, now that she thought of it. But that didn't count. They were so far away. We're coming up on the town, sir! The lookout's warning snapped her out of her reflections and cut off any hope of developing a better plan of action. When the time came, she would just have to jump overboard and hope things worked out somehow. She heard the horsefly buzz of a bullet passing by her head, and though she tried to remain steady, she couldn't help but look to her left, where the Vin fusiliers on the wall were shooting at Mistral. Another bullet hit the envelope above her, sending a puff of its bore doping, jumping from the fabric to be swept back by the slipstream. The captain was below and directly ahead, standing astride a sharply slanting roof, with Jutes and Lord Hinkle sheltering behind the chimney. The ladder was lined up on her, but the slightest change in the wind, if not immediately corrected, would yank the ladder and pitch even the sure-footed captain over the edge and it wouldn't take much more to drag it over the roof and knock Burnett and Jutes over as well. If she thought Hannon's death was hard to explain, it'd be a hell of a thing to account for that sort of massacre. Reverse, Kember called, then ran to the rail to keep the captain in sight, even as the hurricane deck passed over her. The steamjack turbine groaned as Mistral's air screws came to a bouncing halt, twisted clockwise and counterclockwise a few times, before springing into reverse and nearly blasting Kember off the rail with their wash. The ship slowed, came to a full stop with the tail above the captain's head, and the ladder dipped just far enough for its lowest rung to touch the roof. All the captain had to do was step onto it, and they had her. An air of anxiety and guilt filled the ship. 
As Josette went forward through the keel, there were no warm faces or welcome homes, only grim countenances, stiff salutes, and eyes fixed on the wounded side of her face. She stepped down the companionway to find that the unpopular Lieutenant Hannon was nowhere to be seen, and knew instantly that something had happened here. Something damn ugly. She forced herself to ignore it for the moment, while she assessed the tactical situation. Kemper seemed quite relieved to describe it to her, treating the task as a condemned man would treat a stay of execution. But for all that, Kemper had made the right decisions. She was gaining altitude, and in the meantime staying out of the firing arc of the Vin ship. Still, Mistral was out of the fight until she could claw her way up to the enemy ship's lofty altitude, or until Josette gained the power to change the fundamental realities of air combat. And so she had time to get some answers. Where the hell have you been, and where the hell is Lieutenant Hannon? Well, sir, Kember began, then stood with her mouth open at a loss for words. Josette gave up on Kember and looked to Lupian at the rudder. Corporal, she asked, anything to say about this? No, sir, he said, never meeting her eyes. Corporal, I assume you steered Mistral off station. Was an order given to that effect, or was that of your own initiative? She stepped up to him and put her face an inch from his, though his eyes never flinched, never pointed anywhere but directly ahead. Perhaps you were bored with the view over Durham? Perhaps there was a lady you fancied aboard the Vin airship? Lieutenant Hannon ordered it, Kember said. Josette turned to her. Found your tongue? Good. Where is he, so that I may solicit an explanation? Quickly now, Ensign. There's a battle on, and it would be embarrassing to miss it. He's dead, sir, Kember said and looked again at the rail. That's what she had thought. There was some better story behind those three little words, but it was a story she'd never hear, even if she lived to be a hundred. Given time, the account would coalesce into something the whole crew agreed on, and it might even bear some small resemblance to the facts, but the real truth would never come out. It's a loss to the service, she said, knowing better than to squeeze a stone. But we must carry on. What's the disposition of the Vinshaw, sir? Kember turned her head from the rail and stared at Josette for a while, eyes wide. Josette leaned over and whispered, Don't embarrass us in front of the Vins, Ensign. She's... Kember's voice broke, but she swallowed and went on. She's the Ayers de Howe, a two-gun chasseur, sir, of our design. I mean, sir, that she's our exact design. The Vins must have gotten hold of the plans. Josette's face contorted into a snarl so wretched that it invented its own special category of anger. Ensign Camber ceased prattling, took a step back, and tensed as if she expected to be struck. God damn her, Josette muttered. She couldn't even leave me my ship. Sir? You're certain, Josette asked through clenched teeth. She's mistral to a T, sir. Except she's got to be full of luft gas, right? And have a healthy steam jack. And us with inflammable air and a steam jack that's... that's been sorely overtaxed. I mean, sir, one good shot with shell or carcass, or if our engine catches fire again, and we'll be done for. Josette only shook her head and considered her options. If we do climb to engage her, do you have any idea how she'll react? Kember didn't have to think long. She'll decline action if she can. She's not here to sink us, I think, and her captain doesn't want to risk an engagement on even terms. She's here to support the city, or at least preserve the garrison. I think that's why she drew us off station in the first place, sir. She doesn't want to fight, she just wants us out of it. Well, I want us in it, Josette said. But how was she supposed to kill a ship that was 4,000 feet above her when merely shooting off her own guns could blow Mistral to hell, never mind enemy fire? We'll steer a wide circle around the city and watch for a chance to slip in. Elevators, level us off at 1,000 feet, just high enough to offer support to our forces on the ground, should the opportunity arise. As Kember turned to go up the companionway, Josette said, Remain here, Ensign. I may require your counsel. On the rooftop, Jutes was staring up at the Vin airship and cursing up a storm. It's the bloody cheek of it, he said. Uh-huh, Bernat said, traversing Elise's rifle over the field and streets below, watching for movement. They couldn't have changed it just a little? Just to set themselves apart? No, they had to copy it exactly. The bloody cheek of it. 
If the Vim detachment had returned after scattering at Mistral's approach, it had returned with a damn good hiding spot. I think it's safe to climb down. Bloody cheek! I said, I think it's safe to climb down. They descended to find Pesha alive, and if not well, then at least far enough from exsanguation that she wouldn't die within the next hour or so. At least that's what Burnett told himself, as he followed Jutes back toward the prisoner pen. As he went, he looked off to the southeast, where Mistral was still orbiting well away from the Vin airship, having already steered half a circle around the town. The shark doesn't seem very hungry today. Jutes looked at the sky and grinned. She's working up an appetite. The airships circled in concentric orbits, Mistral on the outside, her course describing a circle that stretched well beyond the walls, and Ayez de Hau in a tighter circle, always over the city. Ayez de Hau could merge into Mistral's orbit and bring her to action on highly favorable terms, but the Vinship had no incentive to do so, as it already held the position most favorable to its mission. Mistral could not at once fight an engagement a mile in the air and support the assault at ground level. And even if Mistral did bring the Vins to action, she would be drawn into a long, tedious turning fight rather than the short, decisive engagement Josette desired. She turned to Kember and said, You know this captain's habits? What's he hoping we'll do? He'll be happiest if we try to support the infantry. That way, he can lob shells down on us from the safety of altitude. And I bet he's itching to pull some ruse to trick us into doing just that, but he's worried we won't be fooled again. Besides which, he probably knows our reputation and figures he only has to wait and we'll try something despite the risk. We'll try something despite the stupidity, you mean? Kember only cleared her throat and looked forward. Certainly Josette wanted to try something, but what? Apart from Mistral's bum steam jack and inclination to explode at the merest spark, the two ships were evenly matched in almost every way. From her current unenviable position, how could Mistral sink a ship with all the same strengths and weaknesses? A grin rose slowly on Josette's lips. All the same strengths and weaknesses. Ensign, Josette said, what do you suppose was the greatest flaw in this ship's original design? Kember spoke without hesitation. The goddamn tail nearly came off in a turn. She became quite excited for a moment, but it shifted to anxiety just as quickly. Oh, but sir, the I.S. de Howe hasn't got the yard design. They had six air screws and she has four, like we do now. So we don't know which set of plans she's built from. Josette snorted and took a calming breath. I do. Kember just stared at her, confused beyond the capacity for speech. I ran into the bitch who stole our plans while I was in Durham. Ayez der Howe is built according to our first redesign, and we've improved the tale since then, haven't we? Kember looked no less confused, and rather more alarmed. But sir, we never tested it! Ensign? Josette asked. Yes, sir? I'll have less pessimism on the hurricane deck, please. Yes, sir. Josette turned to Luc Lupien on the rudder. You understand what we're doing? He answered her with a nod and a sly grin. A little more right rudder, then. Easy at first, but we'll maintain this inferior altitude. We'll make a more tempting target all the way down here. She went to the rail to watch the other chasseur, but couldn't see it around Mistral's own expansive superstructure. She had to climb onto the port rail, planting her feet on it and leaning out at a 45-degree angle, with a thousand feet of empty air below her, before she could see the enemy ship. She hung with one hand gripping a diagonal martingale line, the wind in her face. The chill blast hurt her wound at first, but the pain was soon numbed by the cold. Mistral turned inward, cutting across the wide circle she'd been steering. Come on now, Josette said, whispering to the enemy captain across half a mile of sky. If you can outturn us, you get a free shot. If you can't, we're too far below you to shoot back. So what's the risk? But the Vin captain didn't seem to hear, or at least smelled something fishy in her invitation to battle. He maintained his slow, easy turn around the city. Kember must have read it in Josette's face, for the girl leaned over the rail and called, Perhaps if we threaten the garrison, he'll have no choice. Josette grinned. Lupien, 
Bring us right in line with the breach and then hold steady on that course. That would allow the Vin a nice clean shot at Mistral, if he turned just a little. And he did, cutting a straight line across the edge of his orbit. High above he was lining up his shot, and Mistral was steaming right into the line of his guns. Josette watched for the moment they would fire, eyes not on their guns, but on the motion of their tail fins. Left rudder, Josette called, and a second later the Vinchaucer fired her first gun. Her eyes widened. As the second gun fired, she watched the first shell descend through the sky, trailing wispy smoke that glowed orange in the light of the morning sun. It exploded above them at the perfect altitude to set Mistral's envelope aflame, but 50 yards to starboard, the exact distance Mistral had shifted by virtue of her last second maneuver. Smoking fragments of shell casing tumbled into the streets below. The second was lined up right along Mistral's line of flight, and so near that Josette ducked her head at the sight of it. It burst above her, sending red-hot debris into the forward frames. Fire in the nose, she called. Get to it quick, please, because we're not slowing down. Steam jack ahead, emergency power. Rudderman, resume our turn. And as Mistral entered a tighter orbit of the town, turning to keep out of the arc of Ayesder Howe's guns, the Vin captain turned to follow. And why not? He had the height of them, and in the ever-tightening converging circles of a turn fight, he could keep her away from the Vin infantry on the city wall. She looked to Mistral's nose cone. The fire up there was still small, but it wouldn't take much. The number 9 gas bag was less than a yard behind the flames. Worse yet, the fire stoked in the wind, growing larger in proportion to their increased speed. A flame-ringed hole opened in the envelope, and if a single ember went through it... The fire hissed, and steam swept aft along the outside of the envelope. An extra bucket full of water, two actually, and now three, poured from the hole in the nose, as the riggers wisely squandered ballast to make damn sure the fire was out. Above the Ayes der Howe's orbit was a quarter turn behind Mistral's, her orbit tightening, so that just a few circles would bring them far enough into Mistral's turn to take another shot. Which meant Josette had succeeded in convincing the Vin captain to kill her, as she hoped she would. No matter what else happened, no matter her shortcomings, she could take pride in knowing that this one thing she was good at. Another turn of the wheel, Luke, she called the Corporal Lupien. Mistral eased in, her circle matching Ayes der house, but the Vin ship turned tighter still. Half a turn more, she called, not quite so loud this time, as if reducing the volume of the order might create a compromise with its effect on the airframe. She could feel the stress on the superstructure already, as little pops and springs traveled down the keel and out through the longitudinal girders, and from there along the martingale in her hand. The Ayes der Howe turned tighter still, so tight that another circle would bring her guns to bear. Give the wheel another half turn! This was too damn much strain on Mistral's superstructure, but she had little choice if she didn't want to spend the next few minutes on fire. Corporal Lupian had to put his weight onto the wheel and hold it there. At the tail, the rudder shivered against the rush of wind over its surface, doing all it could to resist the turn, as if it knew what a terrible idea this was. And above, the Ayes der Howe matched Mistral's turn with only the slightest effort. It seemed the Vin captain was even cleverer than she thought, for he'd made his own modifications to his ship's tail cone. As hard as she'll go, Luke! There was no going back now, so why the hell not? Lupian hesitated for a moment until she shot him a look that made him think better. He put both hands on the wheel and pulled so hard his feet lifted off the deck. Kimber ran over and pushed upward from the other side to help him. Mistral's tail strained against the turn, the wind so hard on it that ripples ran across its fabric, pressing in and outlining the girders beneath. The entire airframe bent like a macaroni noodle. Mistral made her pain known, crying out all along her length with a sound like the crackle of musketry as slivers of wood flew loose from the overstrained box girders. In frame two, a bracing cable parted with such force that its end whipped back and cut through the envelope. Keel girders groaned on the edge of snapping. A few more moments in this turn, and Mistral would break her own spine. And then, standing out even amidst that cacophony, 
there came the piercing, cracking sound of a keel girder snapping in half. Josette swept her eyes along her ship, looking to see which frame had failed, which girder had given way. She couldn't find it. Daring to hope, she looked up at the other ship and saw its tail kinked, its keel askew. It was the Vins who'd lost the girder. And yet the Vin Chaucer still turned with Mistral and came far enough over to line up the perfect shot. If I as their house shot now, both ships would die together. Mistral by fire, and Ayaz der Hau by the fury of her own guns, her damaged keel torn apart by their recoil. Josette watched without blinking, her eyes watering from the blast of wind against them. And Ayaz der Hau fell off from her turn, and came out of it without firing a shot. Rudder amidships, Josette called. Corporal Lupien only had to let go of his wheel, and it spun back through two turns by itself. The strain came off Mistral's frame as the rudder swung back to its amidships position. Another loud crack drew Josette's eyes up to Ayaz der Hau. A second girder had failed aboard her, but the Vin ship was still in the sky, and still steaming forward with a strange placidity. She could picture the Vin captain racing back through the keel, arriving to find mangled girders and calculating the forces in his head. She could picture it far too easily, for she had once done it herself, and saved her ship from destruction only by the quickest, most decisive action. But the Vin Captain was not quite so quick, nor so decisive. A third girder snapped aboard Ayaz der Hau, its broken ends whipping out through her envelope near the tail. And then, a heartbeat behind, her keel tore itself apart. Josette saw it before she heard it, saw a rift opening on Ayaz der Hau's underbelly, halfway between the air screws and tail. And then the envelope doubled up on itself as the great airship folded into a pathetic V-shaped mass. It fell, keel still twisting around the brake, objects tumbling out of it and coming down faster than the ship. Mere dots at this distance. Equipment and sandbags, she hoped. Someone on Ayaz de Howe's hurricane deck had the presence of mind to pull the emergency ballast ropes, and great gushes of water streamed from the underside of her envelope. She fell through 3,000 feet in mere seconds, but grew lighter as she went. By the time she sank past Mistral, her fall was nearly arrested. She was losing gas, however, and whatever crew remained were running out of ballast to throw overboard. And so, Ayaz der Howe floated on the wind, drifting lower and lower, falling toward the city at a gentle pace. Chapter 20 Well, that's a stroke of good luck, isn't it? Burnett looked at Jutes and found him grinning at the sky. Ain't so much luck, I think. Come on, we got an army to break out of jail. There was no blind approach to the prisoner pen, so they had to advance on it right out in the open. But Mistral was driving down upon the Vin guards, filling more and more of the sky as she approached, which had a rather distracting effect on them. One rifle shot from the airship was all it took, and a dozen hardened fusiliers were begging Jutes and Burnett to accept their honorable surrender. And yet, even after the Vins dropped their muskets, and even with Mistral keeping a sharp-eyed overwatch, Burnett felt hopelessly exposed as he rounded up his prisoners. After all, might one of these fearless men not think it a worthy exchange to trade his own paltry life for the chance to kill a nobleman of Burnett's renown and importance? Luckily, the Fusiliers were but crude accountants, and none of them tried anything. If Burnett hadn't been occupied in freeing the Duramites prisoners, he might have been thoroughly insulted. With the pen open, townsfolk were spilling out with such vigor that they threatened to turn into a rampaging mob. The Vin airship's destruction had restored their spirits, while the humiliation of the pen had brought their blood to a boil. Only Jute's sheer force of personality kept angry townsfolk from beating the helpless Vin prisoners to death. The crush to get out of the pen, the eagerness of the Duramites to take their revenge, was so great that many were pushed up against the Cheval de Frise and cut their hands trying to keep off the blades. It was so bad that above their heads, Josette began shouting at them through a speaking trumpet. 
Mr. Kamal, you want to turn this place into the same goddamn mess that got you caught in the first place? Mrs. Boyev, what would your late husband say if he could see you acting like this? Pierre, you have some sense. Get your brothers into line. Marcel, the dumpling bastard who killed Medina is on the wall, not there. Mr. Niazi, would you sacrifice our chance to retake the town just to lash out at a handful of bastards? If we win, they'll still be there. You can kill them later. She went on like that, calling them by name and imploring them to order. And it worked. Her targets fell shamefacedly into line, one by one. Some even took it upon themselves to bring their fellows to order. Sergeant Jutes, she called down, pointing to the south where the Vin airship had dipped to below the height of the town walls. I want whatever Luftgas is left in that ship. She hasn't surrendered yet, so take as many men as you need to storm her. The others will go with Burnett and attack the breach. Jutes gave an acknowledging signal and saluted. Mistral sprang to life, steaming for the western wall, where the sound of musketry was intensifying. She knows we don't have any weapons for these people apart from the few muskets we took from the Vins, doesn't she? Burnett asked. She knows, Jutes said, as he split his team off from the others. Then what are my chances of taking the breach? Jutes looked at him with an odd expression. Zero, he said. Then what's the point? General Hale raising, the sergeant said with a grin. Don't worry, sir, you'll do great. And with a bellowing war cry, Jutes charged toward the Vin airship, two dozen townsfolk on his heels. Burnett looked to those who were left, numbering several score at least. Rargar and such things, he called, and hobbled toward the breach as fast as the pain in his leg would allow. When he dared to look back, he saw with relief, and no small measure of surprise, that they were all following. Josette looked back over the taffrail until she was certain the mob was following Burnett, and then returned to her station. Sir, Kember said, leaning toward her. You should really have your face looked to. Josette made a point of ignoring her. Rudderman, steer to cross the wall, then turn us parallel to it. In front of the wall, sir? Luke Lupien asked. Not behind it? Between our men and theirs, she said, to give them an example to follow. After a moment's further thought, she added to the elevator steersman, But do keep us above the arc of their cannons. We needn't get carried away. As Mistral came up on the wall, Josette took the opportunity to get a couple of shots at them with the breath guns. But the Vin Fusiliers again showed their steel, staying calm despite their peril. If they tried to rush out of the way, they would have surely bunched up, and Kember's well-aimed blasts of canister shot would have killed a score of them. As it was, the Vins laid flat on the wall, and as the smoke of the shots cleared aft, it was impossible to say what the effect was. The Vins' makeshift wooden cover had two wide gapes in it, certainly but no more than a handful of fusiliers were killed, if even that many. Josette shook her head. Give me ten regiments like this one, and I'll conquer half the world. Only half? Someone asked as Mistral passed above the wall. She couldn't make out the voice, for at that moment, the fusiliers rose up and fired a full volley into the ship's underbelly. Apart from the crack of the discharge, there was the sound of snapping plywood along the keel, and the ping of bullets hitting the steam jack, but blessedly no screams. She ran her eyes over the hurricane deck. No one hurt. Anyone hit? She called up the companionway. Private Davies at the relay position answered her. Grace hit in the arm! Not mortal! And Chief Magusi has a graze. They were aiming amidships at the steam jack, the clever bastards. Damage? She asked, going halfway up the companionway ladder to look along the keel. Magusi's voice came back, shaken but in control. Most of them hit the boiler or aft end of the turbine. His face appeared around the trumpet flare of the turbine, soaked with condensed steam. No damage to the boiler, but until I can patch the turbine, I can only give you about a quarter power. And even that's more risk than I'd like. One quarter power, then. Carry on. He saluted, which was absurd at a time like this, but she returned it out of habit before stepping back to her station. Riflemen, steady, aim fire at the wall. Steersmen, swing us in front of the Garnian companies assembled toward the rear. Below them, whatever was left of the forlorn hope was still pinned in the breach. They hid behind any fragment of rubble large enough to provide protection from the murderous fire pouring into them from the jagged edges of the wall on either side of the breach. Some of them fired back to little effect, and others simply huddled on the unstable scree slope, 
waiting for a miracle. A Guardian company had now advanced to within 300 yards of the wall and was firing by platoon, though with none of the crisp, highly drilled efficiency of the Vin companies. Their muskets were worse than useless at that range, and such an ineffectual, amateurish fire would only boost the defenders' morale. As near as Josette could work out, they'd been brought up to provide cover and allow the Forlorn Hope to retreat from the breach. But the men of the Forlorn Hope were smarter than their officers, and they knew the gambit wouldn't work. Or perhaps it was simply that the men of the Hope were frightened beyond the ability to act, which still put them well ahead of whatever idiot had ordered the platoon fire at 300 yards. She ordered a turn that would bring Mistral around in front of them, went to the rail with the speaking trumpet in hand, and shouted down at the captain of the company. What the hell are you doing back here? She took great care to give her words the form of a question, but the tone of a relayed order. The fight's that way! The Garnian infantry captain, no doubt thinking he'd missed an order, and that he'd be in a great deal of trouble if he didn't show willing and advance with gusto, ordered his company into a quick march. It took some additional motivation from their sergeants, but the company was soon on the move. It's amazing what the fear of being thought afraid will do to an ambitious company captain, Josette said. She looked over the rail to the company still formed up in the rear. But if they don't join the fight, I'd say I'm in rather a lot of trouble. Nothing like what those poor bastards are in for, Ensign Kember said, looking over the opposite rail, where that single company of fangless fops, outnumbered five to one, were charging into the breach. Despite being slowed by his stiff leg, Burnett's little militia couldn't quite keep up with him. They followed several paces behind, which was either an odd sort of politeness or a conscious effort to ensure that Burnett alone bore the consequences of first contact with the enemy. He rounded a connecting street and could see the breach ahead, the broken edges of the wall flanking it, and 250 fusiliers stretched out on either side. Gun smoke drifted up and to the south, the puffs of independent fire mingling in odd patterns with the longer unbroken lines of smoke from volleys, and forming an odd sort of recording of the regiment's musketry. Burnett's group spilled out into the pomeria. Behind him, he heard gunshots. He turned to see what his little militia had grown yet again during his trip, and many of the new recruits had brought rifles or scatter guns. But along with his few musketmen, they fired their shots the second they were on the pomerium. Too great a range for effective fire from such an unsteady force. And so not a single Duramite bullet hit. Other townsfolk had picked up whatever makeshift weapons they could find along the way, and were now armed with pitchforks, threshing flails, rakes, cobblestones, and in one case, even a saucepan. The Vin Fusiliers answered this cosmopolitan array of weapons in the same familiar way, with a thunderous volley of musketry. At orders barked above, two hundred of them ceased their platoon fire, loaded, turned crisply on their heels, and fired together into the town, aiming for the densest part of the mob as they came into effective range. A pitiful, pained collective groan rose from the Duramite mob. Those who didn't fall checked as one, mere yards from the breach. Burnett knew they were stalled even before he looked back at them. He was only surprised at how far behind they were. He found himself very much alone and very much a target, standing halfway between the bulk of his force and their objective. Come on, he screamed, flecks of spittle flying from his mouth, despite how goddamn dry it was. Those boys out there! He was interrupted by the boom and clatter of the cannon in the nearest bastion firing grape shot down at the 132nd. Even though it wasn't aimed at Burnett's mob, that grape shot seemed to freeze them more firmly in place. God damn it, he begged. Just give me a few more yards. The mob did not advance a few more yards, did not climb into the breach, but neither did they run away. His words had stopped a full route, but Burnett had achieved the worst possible compromise, for now his people stood under enemy fire while accomplishing nothing. As much as he cursed them for it, as much as he wanted to call them fools as well as cowards, he was gripped by the same idiotic impulse to freeze where he was. He knew he had to move or die, and yet he stood rooted to the ground, half wishing that a bullet would cut short his failure as a military leader. And a bullet granted his wish. It came not from the wall, but from directly above, 
and was accompanied by the report of a Brewer rifle, distinctly louder than the Fusilier's muskets. More to Burnett's interest, it did not hit him, but plucked the Vin Defender off the wall and sent the man plummeting fifty feet to the pomerium below. Burnett looked up to see Mistral rising over the wall and heard more fire from the ship's brewers. He turned, made a bellowing war cry, and stormed up the inside slope of the breach. Follow me! he screamed. His fighting mob followed. Reverse engine! Left hard rudder! Elevators down five degrees! The captain's orders brought Mistral into a downward, twisting turn as the ship slowed, so that her length came parallel to the wall, her breath guns pointing down at it as she drifted with her remaining momentum. Ensign Kimber was behind the starboard gun, eyes on its forward sight, and hand clenched around its lanyard. The gun sight slid over the slanting wooden roof atop the wall. She couldn't see them, but underneath that roof were men. Men she hated. No goddamn dumpling sympathizer she, but men whose pain and fear were not diminished because of her hatred. In her head, the face of Lieutenant Hannon stared up at her, imploring. Ensign, the captain barked, quit following that gun and shoot! Kember pulled the lanyard without another moment's thought. The morality of inflicting pain and death was one thing, but having the captain mad at you was another entirely. Canister shot exploded from the muzzle, a fanning arc containing a hundred and sixty lead balls that tore through lumber and flesh with equal ease. The protective roof was blasted apart. Pulped bodies flew over both sides of the wall. Even at the edges of the canister shot's destructive cone, splinters of wood flew fast enough to maim. The Vin's composure once again limited their casualties to only a few, but of the men who were killed, the sheer volume and force of musket balls reduced them to mere scraps of meat. Kember didn't let her thoughts dwell on the side of it, only because her duty called her to the port breath gun. This one was loaded with ordinary round shot, the least remarkable of all Mistral's armament. Elevators up, the captain called, her order bringing the ship closer to level. She gave the elevation screw a single turn, sighting on the far edge of the hole she'd already blasted in the Vin's protective roof. She pulled the lanyard, stepped out of the way of the recoil, and peered into the smoke. She couldn't see the shot's effect. The roof blocked the view. But she could hear it. She could hear the cannonball ricocheting inside that tight space, could trace the flight of the ball by the crunching impacts against stone or wood as it bounced right down the line of the wall. A hundred yards away, it hit a merlon and ricocheted out into the town. As the smoke cleared and Mistral steered to come behind the wall, she could see the effect on the Vins. But she only saw it for a moment before she closed her eyes. Damn fine shooting, Ensign! Josette clapped the girl on the shoulder as she looked forward. The cannonball, fired at an acute angle into the space between wall and cover, had bounced between them, killing and maiming as it went before skipping out and falling into the town's ironmonger's scrapyard. It left a dozen Vin infantrymen dead and twice as many missing arms or legs. Taking a rifle, Josette went to the taffrail and looked down into the breach. She spotted Bernie by his stylish jacket, now tattered and caked with mortar dust from the rubble. The Durham mob was behind him, struggling up the unstable inner slope of the breach, scrambling on hands and knees, sliding two yards down for every three up, while the single forward company of the 132nd was climbing the outer slope. The Vins, meanwhile, fired down from the wall on either side. There was only room for one or two men to stand on the jagged edges of the wall, but each fusilier took his shot and stepped aside to let another through, so that together they kept up a continuous fire. Garnians were being slaughtered on both sides of the breach, but even by dying, they were doing the work of a forlorn hope, occupying the defender's attention and giving the 132nd a chance to advance in force. And they were advancing! All the reserve companies were moving forward at double time, and at that speed might arrive just in time to see their friends routed and fleeing the breach, for the renewed forlorn hope was itself wavering. Josette could see it in the way they picked their way through the rubble, not bounding up the slope, but crawling on their bellies from stone to stone, always looking for some outcrop of rubble to keep between themselves and the nearest Vin Fusilier. Only Bernard climbed the breach with vigor, and that was about to get him killed! 
Steersmen, come into the wind and keep us directly over the breach. Riflemen, fire at the vents on the edges. Deliberate, careful aim, please. Below, a fusilier fired his musket and turned to make room for the next. Josette took aim and quite deliberately shot him in the ass. As his comrades came forward to carry him away, she took a fresh rifle and shot one of them in the ass as well. As cathartic as this was after the morning she'd had, her real purpose was to block up the edges of the wall with wounded men who couldn't get out of the way to let new shooters through. And it worked! Bernie led the Durham mob up the slope toward the battered edges of the wall flanking the breach and faced only scant musket fire as he went. Indeed, more fire was aimed at Josette, but she stood her ground, hoping the distance and elevation would protect her, and that the screams of their wounded comrades would unsteady the fusilier's aim. Bernat crested the rubble heap in the middle of the breach. At the top of it, with nowhere to go but down, he turned left and futilely kept trying to go up, climbing hand over hand on the steeper slope leading to the lip of the wall, where the vents were shooting down at them. This made him a very stupid man, but Josette couldn't help but grin at the audacity. It must have amused the advanced company of the 132nd as well, for the Garnian infantrymen rose off their bellies and bounded up the slope, sending loose rocks tumbling behind them to be dodged by their comrades further down. And why wouldn't they race up the rubble? After all, there was a gentleman like them at the top, climbing to attack the Vins without so much as a sword or bayonet, and townsfolk swarming behind him, including one member of the Duramite mob armed only with... Was that really a saucepan? And higher still, there was a mere woman standing stalwart in her airship, half her face ruined but proving by her very accurate rifle fire that Vinzalian asses bled the same color as anyone's. The fighting philosophers stormed the breach, shouting themselves hoarse as they went. Under the cover of rifle fire from Mistral, they followed Bernat's example, climbing to the top of the rubble and then dividing outward to climb to the very top of the wall. The Vins replied with bullets and bayonets and even loose stones tossed from above. Not one of the 132nd made it to the top of the wall, though. A score died trying. But they had done their work nevertheless, for they were in the breach in force. Men from the companies behind them finally arrived, funneling into the breach, and went up the slope in a wave, spilling over the top of the rubble and into the town. The Vin saw the danger and sent companies down the bastion stairs, aiming to form a second defense in the Pomerium below. But wherever the stairs opened onto the Pomerium, there were townsfolk waiting in force, and they were out for blood. And so, on the Pomerium behind the wall, with not a single Vin on the ground to trouble them, the men of the 132nd were being organized into a firing line, in whatever order they came to the breach, and by whatever officers were nearest. They fired one volley at the wall, such a nervous, ill-timed volley that several shots hit Mistral's envelope by mistake. The effort was all but useless in its physical effect. A hundred or more Garnian muskets had slain one or two Vins, if that many. Yet, for all its pitiful effect in drawing blood, that was the volley that won the battle. For it convinced the Vins that they were soon to be facing an overwhelming force inside the town, and that there was nothing they could do to change that fundamental reality, no matter how stubbornly they clung to the high ground, no matter how many Garnians they managed to kill in the meantime. And so, rather than inflame the passions of the victors with a futile effort at holding the wall, they threw down their arms. Send a bird, Josette said. Message to read, Durham is ours!